Amen. Does the whole church say amen? Amen. Church say glory. glory. And hallelujah. hallelujah. God is good. God is great. We thank him for his awesome destiny. We thank him for blessing us yet again to be a part of the worship service on this morning. And it's certainly good uh, to see all of the children of God who come to assemble and to encourage one another uh, in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. It's good to see those whom we have not seen for a while. We're thankful that you have been joining us uh, throughout the uh, year uh, by way of live streaming or however you have joined. And uh, we're thankful to those of you who have been able to be in the worship service uh, as well. Good to see the uh, young people uh, who are with us this morning. We, we haven't seen you all in a while. Y'all have grown a little bit. <laughs> Looks like you've been eating up everything. And we're, we're thankful that God has, has kept you and uh, your parents have kept you and came folk and we trust that things are going all right with you when it comes to, to school. When it comes to school, we, we trust you are enjoying that. I'm still seeing articles uh, uh, encouraging parents to make sure to be careful in the morning when you put the kids uh, on, the, on these Zoom meetings. Uh, remember that, that the cameras can't see you too, all right? The cameras can't see you too. Remember to put a shirt on, man. Uh, uh, when you're, you're uh, with the uh, children and uh, remember that if the uh, mic uh, is not muted that you need to mute uh, your mic because uh, too many parents are saying too many things that I'll not be saying uh, in an educational environment. You, you want to be mindful uh, of, uh, of people, of what people see. You don't want anyone seeing you uh, disciplining the children. Amen? Uh, Slinging the children across the room. Or uh, worse yet, we don't want to see your children with you in a headlock uh, in, the, in the house. So remember that and pray that God will be with everybody during uh, these particular times. God has blessed us. I know that through the years, through this particular year, there have been ups and downs. There have been difficulties. There has been death and dying. There's been pain and sorrow. But we know that everything is still in the hands of a God who's ever able to make everything all right. And we want to continue to encourage the children of God uh, to just uh, hold on. We've been mightily blessed here at the Carver Road uh, Church of Christ uh, in that we've not only been able to share our way of live stream, but we have not ever uh, had to close the doors on, on Sunday morning. And uh, ever since the pandemic began, we have been assembling uh, in worship, and we uh, agree with brothers and brothers in the prayer that we're trying to do everything we can uh, to keep people safe, and we want to encourage you to remember to maintain distance. I, people sometimes act like the church uh, doesn't have enough sense uh, to make its environment safe. They act like we ain't here giving group hug, hugs or bobbing for apples, amen? But we are keeping uh, each other safe uh, we see each other, but we're not getting up on each other. Uh, we're wearing masks. We're not robbing anybody, but we're wearing, we're wearing masks. We're not shaking hands. Uh, we're, not, we're not hugging. Uh, we're not uh, doing any of that. And uh, we're, we're maintaining distance and asking people uh, to sit at a distance from one another. It's amazing. This time last year, we were probably saying to you, sit close. Uh, move it in. But now we're telling and we're saying, sit apart. Uh, and uh, be safe, but but do come and uh, be a part of the worship service. I want to say again that uh, we have enough sense and intelligence and godliness to make our environment safe, but everything still is in the hands of God. Now, we also, on the other side of that, we want to say to church members, uh, believers, don't be out here Acting like you can go everywhere else. Hello, somebody. But you can't go to come to the assembly. And I know people don't like preachers to talk like that these days. They want preachers just to be quiet and don't say what is the, the truth. Or as I said this morning, what is the truth? T R U F. Amen. And you have to tell both the truth sometimes. And uh, on that, and uh, encourage them to be a part of the worship service. This, this schedule. This schedule suits many just fine. You get to stay at home, watch it on television, get up, go to the kitchen, get a snack, come back, and wonder if he's still talking and, and 
and these kinds of things. That, that, that's, but don't, don't fall in love with the steady. Make sure you're in love with Jesus and faithfulness for the glory of God. To any of you may be our guests, we're not members of the body of Christ, we're not in Christ Jesus. We want you to know that we're happy that you're listening and you're joining with us uh, on today. I'm going to be reading from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2, verses 16 through 17. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, as we continue our series of studies uh, in that Gospel. The Bible reads in verse 16, And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eat with publicans and sinners, they said to his disciples, How is it that he eats and drinks with publicans and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he said unto them, They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners too. Repentance. This morning, we want you to focus on the thought. When sinners are the uh, preferable guests, when sinners are preferable guests, perhaps some of you have had opportunity at some point in your life or another to put together a guest list for some event that you were, were holding in honor of a person or for a particular monumental get-together. And in composing that, that list, you try to make sure that you invite guests who are going to be fitting to the situation. Oftentimes today, people put together guest lists and they don't want any, any children to attend. They put together guest lists and they want people of a certain income level to attend or a certain educational level to attend. Uh, and they ask people to RSVP uh, to that particular uh, event. We are talking about this morning when, when sinners are the preferred guests. I know at your weddings and, and things of that nature, you want uh, certain people to show up at the wedding you, if you are if you are a woman, you don't want any of your the groom's ex-girlfriend's families, amen, to show up at the wedding. Uh, if, uh, if, if you are the bride, I, I mean, if you're the groom, none of your ex-girlfriends have got to show up. They are not preferred guests uh, at the wedding. You don't want folks to come to the wedding who spend most of their days uh, intoxicated because you don't know how that person may act at the wedding. Again, we're talking about preferred guests. There are, are some people you, you, you want to come to who, who don't want to come, even though they are on your preferred guest list. You invite them, they don't show up. And when Jesus came to earth, you must understand that there were some people that he would have uh, there, and he did invite, but who chose not to be around Jesus Christ. Jesus did try to reach out to his own. And the text says, uh, he came to his own, and his own received him not. John 1 and 11. He experienced what is witnessed throughout life. The very people expected to uh, be the preferred crowd determined that uh, you are not good enough, or in the case of Jesus, they determined that he was not good enough to spend their time around I, and it's sad for anybody who believes that Jesus is a father to his or her life. Amen, somebody. Uh, it, it's an egregious situation for anybody who believes that Jesus is in the way of peace and happiness and a good life. I tell you, everybody ought to desire uh, to be around Jesus and, and to know Jesus and to accept what Jesus has to offer, but you know for yourself that uh, everybody doesn't have time for Jesus Christ. Even on, on Sunday morning, there are a lot of people who are glad they don't have to uh, drive to a church building and be with church folk. They don't care that much about it. Sing songs that they are half-hearted about and, and fight through sermons that they can't stay awake through. Both are glad not to have to be bothered with that kind of church stuff. 
the scribes and the Pharisees, the more religious people of Jesus' day rejected the ministry of Jesus Christ. And I, I, we are not be surprised today that people reject having anything to do with Jesus Christ. The most religious people of Jesus' day uh, rejected the ministry of Jesus Christ. The first thought would be that people who focus so much attention uh, on knowing the law like the scribe, they, they wanted to know the law. You would think somebody who spent so much time trying to know the law or, or like the, the Pharisees, uh, someone who spent so much time trying to keep every facet of the law. It was in their DNA. You would think that those people would be first to rally around Jesus Christ and to be on the guest list. What became evident was that these who appeared to be religious, donning religious robes, making broad their phylacteries, enlarging the borders of their garments, they, they look religious. You know how to look religious. You can look at some folk and they just look like they are religious. And you had the folk who talked a great talk, who knew every chunk and tittle of the law. They look religious and, and they talk religious. But you understand that everybody looking religious and everybody talking about religion is not religious. Everybody who looks like he's a church man or she's a church woman uh, and everybody who talks hallelujahs and praise God and too blessed to be uh, uh, stressed and, and, and God is my captain and he's in my, everybody talking like that is not necessarily faithful to Jesus Christ. And folks have to understand that sometimes there can be a wide gap between the religion of my talk and the religion of my behavior. I've got to talk religion, I ought to live religion. I ought to live my faith. The Bible says about these scribes and Pharisees, they rejected Jesus, but they weren't in a group by themselves and rejecting Jesus Christ. You also have the priests and Levites of Jesus today who, 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 who uh, focus on being sanctified, sanctimonious. They didn't want to get touched by anything that might make them a dirt. They knew a lot about being sanctified in the sight of God, but very little about being a neighbor. So Jesus tells a story about a man who fell among thieves and the priest and the Levite passed by on the other side and it was the Samaritan who came to his aid. And I tell you, although they knew the law as well as they did, they flunked the test on being a neighbor. I'm saying this morning, when I was in school a long time, long time ago, but not as long as some folks. Uh, you, when you used to, to make mistakes on your paper, they used to correct it in red ink. Y'all remember that? Yeah. You knew. Brother, brother, brother Black, you look like you remember that. Amen. <laughs> you knew that you had got some stuff wrong on your paper because of all the red ink on, on, on your, your paper. They tell me today that, that that's not good teaching because it emotionally upsets some students. Well, some of them need to be emotionally upset. But uh, they tell me, you don't do that anymore. But if the, if the scribes and Pharisees had had their paper corrected, their scrolls corrected, there would have been read everywhere with the note. Go ye and learn this, what, I, what it, uh, it means. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And I say this morning, sinners are preferred guests of Jesus Christ. We understand the dynamics of such disconcerting scenarios, and I need you to put a, a little more sound into, into the mic. We, we understand when, when the wrong folk show up uh, at, at, at an event. For example, some of y'all are good employees, right? You, you were good employees. You, you were the model employees. Ain't nobody saying nothing. The good employee, the it discovers that he or she has been invited to the company event. We are invited to the company get together of respected and valued employees with great anticipation and with unrestrained excitement. One prepares himself or prepares herself to come to such a gathering, uh, 
and to receive the recognition he or she thought was well deserved. deserved. Some of you have gotten that recognition. Well, you've got the gold watch when you retire. You, you've got the recognition where when you got a plaque, you were invited uh, to the company get together of good employees. After all, it would be fitting to recognize this employee who never dared uh, to be taught. Some folk are never late to work. Fought through torrential rains, white out snow events, threatening tornadoes and, and stifling heat waves to never miss a day of work. This employee who rose to every challenging occasion, identified completely with the vision of the company, even added valuable insight that moved the company forward. Certainly, this employee would be invited to the employee recognition ceremony. And I trust that sometime or another in your life they'll recognize you, they would recognize you as an exemplary worker and a good employee. So this person with great anticipation gets ready to go to the event and he's thinking about all of the people who should be there, but he's also thinking about, and she's also thinking about the people they know won't be there. You know, when it's time to recognize good employees, you can just think in your mind, well, I know she's not invited. Well, I know he's not invited. Imagine then the arresting development that when you arrive, what is witnessed and shockingly apparent is that there are a number of employees gathered, reaching for the orders, gathered there, standing around the fruit bowl punch, and hobnobbing with company employees who had uh, received employee notices over and over again for poor performance. There was the man who was late as many times as there are days in a year. There is the woman who could never quite perform the standards, always asking help of others. There was the one who was told so many, has told so many stories that nobody knew when he was telling the truth. There too was another suspected of stealing from the company. You go to his or her house and there are all the company pins and all the company paper clips and that person is there. Then there was the woman who quickly rose to prominence, suspected of charming every manager she ever had. How could these be invited to the event where there were respectable employees? We think that we're showing up at the wrong event because the preferred guests seem to be the wrong guests. I want you to understand this morning that when you look in on the people of God, you don't see people who have never seen it. Amen, somebody. In the assembly, perhaps y'all don't know that. But in the assembly of the church, these are not folk who have lived perfectly. These are not folk who have never said a cross word to anyone else. These are not folk who didn't have to be driven home because they couldn't be behind the steering wheel, same man when we came. These, these are not folk who always talk right and do right and be right. Everybody who comes to where Jesus is comes understanding that he and she are sinners before God. The preferred guests in, at Jesus' event are people who are sinners. How is it we ask sometimes? That the child who does not have the wherewithal to help with the needs of an aged mother, who even borrows money from her, give it to her by the other children. I'm talking about he never does right. But it seems like mama's more in love with him than she is all the other children. How is it that the student who, who seems to get the worst grades oftentimes seems like the church, uh, the, the teacher's pet? In Jesus' time, what in heaven or earth? What's going on with the anointed one was in the middle of a ruckus of a party who guests loot this included notorious sinners and societal rejects. The scribes and Pharisees were complaining because Jesus was in a house with a bunch of sinners. And I tell you, when we think about the church, we think about folk who have understood that they have been sinners in the sight of God. Nobody here put them. Nobody here has ever lived perfectly. Yeah. Every one of us are sinners in the sight of God. Yeah. And I say this morning, of course, remember something about what, what, our, what our greatest need is. I know during this time of societal unrest, 
But we're focused on justice. And we're focused on racism. And we're focused on an executive level of leadership that seems only to be concerned about itself. That beyond that need is the need for all of us to recognize that if everybody was being treated justly in our imagination, if the White House was doing what we thought it should be doing, if our neighbors were kind to us, it still would not dismiss the truth that we all need Jesus because we are all sinners and have sinned in the sight of God. Don't ever forget that God is trying to deal with our sin problem. God is trying to show us the way that will help us to live in such a way that the he that heaven is glorified. God wants to do something about our sin problem. <laughs> now, this becomes important uh, in the church because a lot of folks can feel good in the church because they are reaching out and trying to remedy what's going on in society but not trying to remedy what's going on in their personal lives when it comes to sin. You can be good to everybody and not be right with Jesus. Amen. That is, society can give you medallions and honors and plaques and trophies and you still not be right with God. And what we want to do ultimately is to show people that there's a God who loves them, who calls them near to himself because he wants to do something about what is our greatest failure and at the same time a great need. And our greatest fear is our not recognizing that the God who loves us should be able to call us near to Him. Yeah. I said the God who loves us ought to be able to call us near to Him. Yeah. And we ought to want to come. We ought not be rejecting God. Yeah. We ought not be rejecting Jesus. Yeah. We ought not be turning a deaf ear to Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. There are some other folk we ought to be rejecting. And there's some other folk we ought to be turning a deaf ear to. But how in the world can any one of us want to turn a deaf ear to Jesus Christ? How in the world can any one of us say about God and say about Jesus that they're not better to us than we are to ourselves? How can we even imagine that anybody can inform us better about life, sustain us better in life than God can and His Son Jesus Christ? I know we all want to be successful in this world. We all want to have things in this world. But we have to realize we are living in God's world. And if God doesn't say yes, there is no yes in our lives. Yeah, yeah. I hear people say all the time what they want from God. They want God to give them a job. They want God to give them a people. They want God to give them happy marriages. But when it comes to God, they don't want to do anything for Him. Some of the people asking those things of God even today don't have the humility to gather with the people of God and worship. And I'll tell you something. There is something wrong with my Christianity when I don't want to take the time to gather with the people of God and worship. Amen. Now, I'm saying this not only for us here in this building, but I'm saying this to people who may peak at a live stream. We ought to desire to do what God has commanded us to do. And everything God ever asks us to do, He does it for our well-being. There are a lot of things we do that are not for our well-being, but everything God asks of us is for our well-being. God doesn't do us wrong, we do God wrong. And before I get on my high horse and talk about what I expect from God, I ought to have the humility to say, I owe God yeah, yeah. for how good God has been to me. You know, God has been good enough to every one of us oh, yeah. that not, I'm not be anything He asked of us yeah. that we wouldn't want to give to Him. Yeah. Now, some folk, it's not just about putting forth the effort to give God the Lord. It's having the faith to give God glory. Amen. Yeah. You see, most people can worship God when the sun is shining. Yeah. And, and a lot of folk can, can come to God when the weather is fair. But what we realize as children of God is even when the storm outside, we ought to serve God. Yeah. 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 We ought to realize 
We ought not to serve God when all our friends are treating us like if all of our friends are treating us wrong, we still want to serve God. We ought not serve God when we pay all our bills in advance, when they're stacked up on the table and we don't know where the next money is coming from. We still ought to take the time and give God praise, glory, and honor. If anything, we ought to want to keep right in our lives. It ought to be our relationship with God all life. There are a whole lot of people who are trying to live Christianity these days from a weak perspective. If everything's going all right, I'll be at church. If the car's going right, I'll be at church. I'll come to this center. If I've got the job I want, I'll be at the center. If those both are active right, I'll be at the center. The truth is, if you've got to cross the Red Sea and the Jordan River and stay 40 years in the wilderness, and tackle Jericho, stay in a lion's den, or in a fiery furnace, you ought to want to serve God. And all of this weak stuff going around, where folk are lying around, talking about why they can't serve God at this time, God's going to hold us accountable for every bit of that. I know you would if you could, if the weather were good. The question is what you're going to do when it's pouring rain outside. Well, there's a whiteout condition during the snow. Yeah. Will you serve God then? Yeah. Well, why should I have answered the question? When Jesus determines who he's going to be with, he comes right into the midst of sinners like us yeah. and spends time with us. Yeah. And I'm amazed by the fact that as bad as I am, Jesus said, I can come into his presence and be with him. Come into his presence and enjoy a meal with him. Come into his presence and sit down with him. I become a preferred guest of Jesus Christ because I acknowledge I am a sinner in need of God. Now, now, now that, that, that's, that's the first part for all of us to realize. And there's no exception in here. That we've all been sinners. Yeah. You, don't look back, y'all. You, <laughs> you've been a sinner. Yeah. You, you've been a sinner. Yeah. Yeah. And that's no mystery to God. Yeah. And it's no mystery to anybody in here. Here's the other thing I've been a sinner, and other folk know it. Yeah. yeah. You don't have to look to your neighbor, but if you're one of those other kind of churches, so look to your neighbor and tell your neighbor, neighbor, you've been a sinner. And you need God. Here, here's the next thing after God that I, I've been a sinner. I've said Jesus tells that story about those coins, that coin, and, uh, about the sheep, and about the lost son and the loving father. And he makes this statement If you want to call joy in heaven, the most joy in heaven, he says, The more joy in heaven. Over one sinner who repents, yeah. more than 99 just persons yeah. who need no repentance. Mm -hmm. I can cause joy in heaven. I can cause celebration in heaven. Yeah. And it's greater joy, greater celebration than at other time. The text says there's more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents more than 99 just persons who need no repentance. That's one thing to acknowledge I, I'm a sinner. It's another thing to repent. See, I don't, I don't just stay in sin. I, I turn that stuff around. I repent. And that's where the dividing line comes. You can get folks saying, well, I know I'm never wrong. I know I'm saying it's another thing completely to get them to understand that you need to repent. Yeah. And you repent by turning your life over to Jesus. Yeah. You don't repent by knowing you sin. Yeah. One repents by turning into her life over to Jesus. Yeah. If I won't turn my life over to Jesus, then I misunderstand how the preachers my sin is. Boy, girl, man, or woman, you don't want Jesus to come back and you are caught in your sin. You may feel like right now you're big enough and you're bad enough to reject all that, but you don't want to get caught yeah. with Jesus coming back and you're caught in your sin. So I have to add this. I know it's not popular in America. It's not popular in religion. 
it's not politically or religious, it's correctly correct. But if I'm caught in my sin, as good as I've had it on earth, it can be multiple times more miserable after this present life. Yeah, I know. Now, Bible passed this morning, we study the story of the rich man who was pulled in purple and fed so much every day. The beggar laid in his gate full of swords. Understanding that the only way he could be full of swords was laying at that gate is that he'd been there a long time. The dog came and licked his swords. He desired just to be fed with the crumb that fell from the rich man's table. The Bible said when he died, he was carried by angels in the Abraham bosom. But the, the, but the rich man died in the very The next verse says, in hell he lifted up his eyes. Now, now, here's a part of the Bible that doesn't get preached anymore. Jeff, you're big enough and you're bad enough to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and act like it does not have any reference to you. You keep on with your bad self. Very sumptuously every day. Dress like you want to dress. Drive what you want to drive. Go where you want to go. Be who you want to be. You think that doesn't apply to you, so you just live like you want to live. But one of these days, you're going to find yourself lift up, uh, lifting up your eyes in hell. And what part of that? What part of that is not possible? The hell part. Yeah. Because what you don't do today is talk about a God and a Jesus. That includes hell. And not only did it say in hell he looked up his eyes, he said, it says he was in torment. Yeah. Torment. Right. Now you know they bought Boogie Boogie and June Bug and Shalady and Shirey into the building the last time. And they said they're in a better place right now. Everybody dying is not going to a better place. And the truth is, if there is a God. There's a place of torment. Yeah. Now the only way you know how not have a place of torment is that there be no God. Yeah. But if there is a God, there is a place of torment. Yeah. And it's a place that's made wider as is necessary. Yeah. There's room for more in it. Yeah. Now, now I don't know if I'm a Jesus preach like that, what he's trying to do is he's he trying to move people by way of, of uh, threat, yeah. of torment. I tell you what, you better be moved by threat of torment, yeah. lest you end up in the torment. But here's the other thing, church folk. One of the reasons we don't evangelize is because we have forgotten there's a place of torment. Don't you know that if my kinfolk don't obey God, they'll end up in a place of torment? If my mama doesn't obey God, she can be tormented no matter how good a mother she was. Amen, somebody. My daddy, as well as he provided, if he doesn't come to understand the love of God, if he rejects Jesus, he can end up in torment your spouse, in torment your children, in torment. The reason we ought to open our mouths up is because we don't want to see folk go to torment. But right now, we got some cold ones up our family. Who we see every day, who are headed straight to torment. Yeah. Amen. The Almighty Quiet. Yeah. So you need to get up off that negativity. No, I need to stay in this reality. Yeah. God is God enough to do everything He says. And I've got to ask you a question. What person in his or her right mind, I said the right mind, would know that there's a God who has no power? I said, right now. And then reject him. You cannot be in your right mind to believe that there's a God with that kind of power and reject him. And you don't have to. There's no reason to reject Jesus and not want Jesus. Because I said, when Jesus shows up at his event, when Jesus as it is at any event, what it demonstrates is that he can be around sinners. 
He can be around sinners. He can accept sinners. You haven't done so much. I have not done so much. I haven't been out there so far. I haven't sucked so deep. I, I haven't been so high that Jesus cannot save. He accepts sinners. So I began with accepting that, that I have sinned. I understand that I need to repent. And then what I do is I accept remission of sins. Acts 2, 38, Peter says to the people, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. Yeah. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. How can I not end up in torment? How, how can I end up in the end in good grace? How can I live my life of being pleasing to God except remission of sins? Remission of sins is to accept that, that God does want continued fellowship with me. Remission of sin said that I accept that I need to be around the throne of grace and, and mercy. Uh, remission of sin said that I understand that as bad as things have been, God is able to make them better. Uh, remission of sin says that I understand who the preferred crowd is for Jesus. Jesus says in Matthew 21 and 31, Verily I say unto you, the publicans, and the heart is going to the kingdom of God before you. But John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and you believed him not. But the publicans and hearted believed him, and, and when you, you, you had seen it, repented not afterward that you might believe him. What Jesus is saying is that the folk we considered bad, the folk we thought should be at the, at the company recognition part, the folk we thought were really the lost ones, sometimes those folk come to God quicker than folk who got everything. That is, the folk we look down on, the publicans, the folk we look down on, the loose women, like the harlots, they got the sense enough to understand that they are sinners in need of Jesus Christ. You know, who doesn't think he needs Jesus, who doesn't think she needs Jesus, oftentimes it's a person who's got the clothes he or she wants to wear, goes to the school, the university he or she wants to go to, has enough money to pay his and her bills, drives what he wants to drive, get a good report at the doctor's office. Sometimes we've got so much good going for us that we cannot see Jesus Christ. We need to learn to have the attitude that the public and the sinners had, the hardest had, they knew they were sinners and tried to come to Jesus Christ. And the question is this morning, what do you know about your own state before God? Do you accept that the only reason you ever received an invitation from God is because you understood that you were a sinner? Yeah. And without exception, that's all of us. Yeah. That you were willing to repent of your sins and then to have your sins remitted by God. If you're not a child of God this morning, here's the way you become one. You, you hear the saving message of the love of God, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to do so pleasing and him should not perish but have everlasting life. God commends his love toward us and then while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Jesus came and lived on this earth. He suffered humiliation, was crucified on the cross, that he died on the cross, but God raised him from the dead. He then ascended to heaven ever lives to make intercession for us. You yeah. must be willing to believe that. But beyond your belief, you've got to be willing to act upon it. If I won't act upon it, it doesn't really mean anything. How many people have you, have you told the gospel? And they tell you, I understand. I know where you're coming from. Yeah. I need to do that. But if they don't ever move, the gospel has done them no good. Just acknowledging it and refusing to obey. That's, that's my kid that said, where confess Jesus as Lord. And then we're buried in baptism for the mission of sin. Rising to walk in the newness of life. How did you get here this morning? What made you good enough to come to church? I tell you, it's because you want Jesus to prefer yes, this. When sinners are the preferred yes. If you need God this morning, and anyway, make it known as together we stand and sing an invitation song. Come to Jesus.